agreement. Welcome to the Thursday, April 11th, regular monthly meeting of the Portsmouth School Board. We apologize for our tardiness. We were dealing with a few discipline cases in the back, and we take those very seriously, but thank you for your patience. I ask now that we will stand now for a moment of silence. You may be seated. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> All right, that's better. And welcome to our board meeting. And tonight we have Churchland Middle School students that are here before us. And I will call, as I call them up, I will read a short bio on each student. So during the Pledge of Allegiance, we have Chase Liggins. Chase, if you will come forward, and as you come, I'll read a little bio. Chase is an eighth grade student at Churchland Middle School. He's an active member of the National Junior Honor Society and has helped with their Adopt-a-Spot Adopt Project induction ceremony. Chase plays the violin in Churchland Middle's orchestra along with playing steel drums in a community group. The Rhythm Project. Chase also volunteers through his church, Centennial Baptist Church, helping in soup kitchens and visiting nursing homes. Additionally, he plays in rec league basketball. At the high school, Chase plans to pursue his love of science by becoming a geneticist. If Chase's family is present, please stand and be recognized. Providing our statement from Churchland Middle School, we have Tania Outland. Tania, you come forward. She's a seventh grade student at Churchland Middle. She's an active member of the National Junior Honor Society and earned a spot on the Churchland Middle School's Math League competition squad this spring. Tania's favorite subject is science, where she explores her interest in discovering why and how things work. She's also active in her church, Grove Baptist Church. After graduating from high school, Tania plans to attend Johns Hopkins University and become a general surgeon. If Tania's family is present, please stand and be recognized. I'd also like to acknowledge the administration from Churchton Middle School. Dr. Barbara Kimsey is present. Mr. Garcia and Ms. Perry Campbell. Assistant principals, thank you all for being here. And are there any other members of the junior trucker family present? If, if so, would they please stand at this time? Thank you all for being in attendance. All right, so at this time, Chase, I'll turn it over to you. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. And uh, if the parents want to come to the front so you can take pictures, feel free to do so. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may not be seated. Good evening, Vice Chair Patillo, members of the Personal Public School Board, and Superintendent Dr. Bracey. My name is Tania Outland and I am a seventh grader at Churchland Middle School. I am a member of the National Junior Honor Society and the CHMS Math League. My favorite subjects include science, math, and history. My future career goal is to attend John Hopkins University and become a general surgeon. I have enjoyed my first year in middle school. I have had some wonderful teachers who have helped me learn and grow as a student leader. Through my involvement in clubs and activities, I have had the opportunity to volunteer during our school's charter course night to help new students learn more about the great opportunities at our school. Some of the clubs we had at our, at our school include Chrome Club, The Math League, NJHS, SCA, Yearbook, Scholastic Bowl, Art Club, Chess Club, GPS, and Charms. 
As part of my history class, last weekend we took a field trip to the Virginia Holocaust Museum and the Virginia Museum of Culture and Richmond to connect what we have learned in our history class. I also love the way that our school keeps students motivated with checker books. We have the opportunity to get rewarded for modeling our GPS, which we say every morning in our affirmation. Today, I will take ownership in my learning experiences. Today, I am guided by my GPS. G, give respect. P, prioritize responsibility. And always remember S, safety first, because CHMS is my GPS for success. When we model our GPS, teachers will give us checker books that we can later cash in for prizes and treats. We are also able to give checker books to our teachers that are called checker treasures. So they are also rewarded for the great things they are doing in school and in the classroom. I am proud to attend church for middle school, and I look forward to getting more involved next year. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share with you this evening. If you all could stay there just for a moment, our board member, Ms. Shoemaker, has something she would like to present to you. And Administration, if you all want to come forward at this time, you can. Before you all, before our students sit down, I just want to say that um, I'm, I'm very proud. Chase, he's one of my mentees, and uh, he's done an amazing job in school academically and as a new track athlete, so he's a prime example of a student athlete. And Ms. Outland, you come from good stock. Your, 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 your mother was my high school class president, and, and she was a genius in school. Now your dad, he was he was pretty smart. He wasn't as smart as her, but he was pretty smart. <laughs> but but you, you, have a, you have an amazing family. You all are great students, and, and you are exactly what Portsmouth represent, and that's the finest in the Hampton Roads area. So I thank you all for coming tonight on this evening. We will now have our mission statement read by board member Shoemaker. The mission of the Portsmouth Public School Division is to engage all students in learning that will foster academic excellence and responsible citizenship. Thank you. We now have our attendance roll call vote. Madam Clerk. Oh, sorry. Please notify your attendance. Oh, you hit parent. Eight members present, one member absent. Mr. Parent is on vacation. Thank you. I will now entertain a motion for the approval of the agenda for April 11, 2019. Move for approval. Second. Second. Approval made by Ms. Williams and second by Ms. Hines. I will now ask you to place your vote now on your panel. And if someone can hear yes for me, I'd really appreciate it. I mean, really, kind of work me. <laughs> I'll give you time. <laughs> it's unanimous. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, one of my favorite parts of the evening will now be our student representative 
Report. Miss Bellamy, you come forward, please. Good evening, Chairman. Ooh. Vice Chair Patillo, Dr. Brace, member of the school board. So since we last spoke, um, I've been a little busy. Um, I attended the city council school board retreat where I interacted with you guys and the members of city council, which was interesting. It was a different way to look at some of the stuff that goes on in the division, so that was nice. Um, I also had the opportunity to read at the Boss Authors Book Club over at Brighton. Um, with Mrs. or Dr. Diva. That was interesting. Um, I read Wings and I interacted with the kids. They asked me questions about my position, took a few, video, took, took a few videos um, and some pictures and passed out a couple of goodie bags with books so they could continue to journal as they had been doing in the club. Some different things going on in our division. We had the CTE and College Fair Day over at Wilson couple weeks ago back in March that was really interesting um, I got accepted to like four or five colleges that day so that was nice and I also oh, wow. got to see some of the different CTE things that we're doing in the division we also had STEM day where a lot of the schools came and they showcased some of the different things they're doing with science and technology in the school so again that was nice we also had the PBIS basketball game um, with the middle schoolers, and they came out, played, had a good time, met a few people, saw the cheerleaders, which was nice and a different way to do some things. And lastly, for events, we had the job fair over at IC Norcom. I know a lot of my friends were excited. They got internships, they got jobs, so that was nice. I hope we keep that up. And then just some announcements. For those that don't know or haven't heard yet, the superintendent advisory council meeting was moved from the 10th to the 25th and is the last one for the year. So if you guys could continue to put that out and making sure that we have a huge turnout for the last one. And then I will be recording my final edition of Portsmouth the Finest with some other student reps from the division. So I have the reps from Norfolk, Hampton, and I think Virginia Beach. So they're going to come down and we're going to do a show and that'll be out. And that is all. I would also like to state that uh, Ms. Bellamy, she excelled at the Virginia Association of Career, Family, Career, and Community Leaders, and she will be moving on to Anaheim, California <laughs> to compete at the national conference, national level. So uh, we're very proud of her. And, and I'm going to make sure we, we gather together and support you to get there and do what you need to do to excel. So thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Hines? I think you need to, I'm oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. I think you need to do your, your publication, Portsmouth's mm -hmm. Finest, mm -hmm. from the beaches at Anaheim, just okay. to give yourself a plug. <laughs> because this has been your thing, and you can talk about how you've grown and what you've done. And I'm just going to say, with you being in the room and participating with city council and school board in that retreat was powerful. I mean, to see, I'm a teacher and I'm also a mom and I'm also, I like to watch people. Um, but to see the connections and what was going on in your head and how you were putting two and two together, girl, you got it. So I just wanted to give you a shout out because you are going out and you are putting people in play and you're putting ideas out there and you are you are raising people up to a higher level and so I just want to thank you for being you but I will say you probably need to do a little snippet from Anaheim California just so you can say you've done Portsmouth's finest coast to coast okay okay mm. thank you thank you thank you Moving on to agenda item 4.1, consideration of a religious exemption. I will entertain a motion for that now. Second. It's been moved by Ms. Hines and second by Mr. Lamb. I ask you to make your vote by electronic vote this time. And if someone can get me, I appreciate it. It's unanimous. 
agenda item 4.2, consideration of an expulsion for discipline case 2018-1912. I will entertain a motion at this time. Move for approval. Second. second. Motions, motions are made by Ms. Hines, second by Ms. Allen. You can now place your vote electronically. Excuse me, Mr. Pines. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Six yes votes, two no, it passes. Agenda item 4.3, consideration of an expulsion, discipline case 2018-1913. I'll entertain a motion at this time. Move for approval. Second. Move for approval by Ms. Hines, second by Ms. Allen. You may now place your vote electronically. It's unanimous. Thank you. We'll now move to agenda item 4.4, electronic vote consideration of expulsion case, discipline case number 2018-1914. I'll entertain a motion at this time. 4.4, correct. What's recommendation for new direction? Oh, I'm sorry. Recommendation for new direction for one year. Move I'll entertain a motion. Second. Motion has been made by Ms. Williams and second by Ms. Allen. You may now cast your vote electronically. It's unanimous. Agenda item 4.5, electronic vote, one year, and new directions, discipline case number 2018-1915. I entertain a motion. Miss uh, Hines. Um, 4.5 is case number 2018-19-15. Turn um. your mic on. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I just want to make sure we're reading the correct case number. Yeah, what is, it's okay. different. I see it's different. Because it bounces up. Okay, I see it was a switch. It's actually case number 2018-1916. That's 15. Is that right? Recommendation new direction. Wait. 4.5 is 15. Look at this one right here, which is where it's supposed to be. 15. Okay, Which one are we on? 115, correct? correct at first is expulsion for case 1915. 4.5? 4.5 4, 4. 4. on the agenda is not the same as oh, okay. probably what you're looking oh, for. Oh right, that's at the top. Right. So we're doing 4.5. 4.5 is consideration for expulsion. 1915. 1915. Okay. Move for approval. Second. Second. Motion's been made by Ms. Hines, second by Ms. Allen. You may now make your vote electronically. Six yes votes, two no, it passes. Agenda item 4.6, new directions for one year. Discipline case number 2018-1916. Move for approval. Second. Motion's been made by Ms. Hines, second by Ms. Williams. You now place your vote electronically. It's unanimous. Thank you. Now moving to our curriculum and instruction monthly report. Dr. Wynn. 
Good evening, Vice Chair Patillo, <laughs> members of the board, Dr. Bracey. Thank it's you. always a pleasure to give you the curriculum and instruction report, and tonight, once again, I call your attention to the written report, which is in board docs. And in addition to that, we have a very special treat tonight with two of our students who are coming to talk to us about their experience in the 21st Century Learning Program at Churchland Middle School. We have with us Bright Azubike, and Bright is here with his father, Philip Azubike. Bright, if you'll come forward. <laughs> Bright is a seventh grader, and he's, at, he's actively involved in the 21st Century Program since his arrival there this year. He's also a member of the National Junior Honor Society chapter there. He participates in the PPS Gifted and Talented program and in the Churchland Middle School GPS Boys Empowerment Group, Gentlemen Pursuing Success. In addition, he plays steel drums as a member of the Portsmouth Rising Stars. And he also plays the piano, the guitar, and the baritone horn. After high school, Bright plans to attend college and pursue a career as either a medical doctor, musician, computer programmer, or a video game designer. I think you can do them all. all yes. <laughs> Next, we have Miss Amaya Washington, and she is here with her grandmother, Patricia Washington, and another family member, Mr. Richard McPherson, if you all would stand. Thank you. Amaya is an eighth grader at Church and Middle School, and she's also participated in the 21st Century After School program since seventh grade. She pursues her passion for stepping and dance as part of the dance and step teams that perform at school events through 21st Century. She is a member of the Church and Middle School Student Council Association and the Yearbook Club. This year, Amaya was honored by being designated as the eighth grader with the best school spirit by her peers. She also serves as Speaker of the House for her civics class. Outside of school, Amaya is a praise dancer for her church, Garden of Prayer, in addition to being active in Sankofa, Sankofa where she learns about her culture and prepares for her future. After high school, Amaya plans to attend college and pursue a career in either professional photography or in the medical field. Let's give them our attention. Good evening, Vice Chair Patillo, Honorable School Board members, Superintendent Dr. Bracey, Assistant Superintendent Dr. Wynn, and Chief of Schools Dr. Camardi. My name is Amaya Washington. I'm an eighth grader at CHMS. Good evening. My name is Brian Zubike, and I'm a seventh grader. And I'm a seventh grader at CHMS. Today we'll be today we'll be sharing with you some of the um, some of the activities that we do in the 21st century program. The, if you were to ask me to describe 21st century in three words, they'd be interesting, fun, and valuable. I say interesting because in 21st century, we have a, multiple, we have a multitude of things that catch my interest. Interesting things we do include learning about math through cooking and tutoring that helps me with upcoming tests and projects. We have made ice cream, pudding, and pancakes, and even tie-dye shirts. We also have band, keyboard, an art club, a step team, and even a photography club. When I say fun, I say this because we get to go on field trips and meet new and amazing people. We have been on field trips that include live plays, the Virginia International Tattoo, the National Museum of Natural Science in D.C., and even basketball games. During summer camp, we played educational games, went on more field trips, and even went swimming. When I say valuable, I say this because when we grow up and look back on our middle school experiences, we will always remember 21st century. I will never forget dancing and stepping for 21st century at Pat Riley's and making a lot of new friends. And also the fact that we're able to learn in a way that helps us understand through hands-on activities. I really wish that there was a 21st century in high school, but I can honestly say I enjoyed my time and I will miss 21st century. Especially Dr. Jackson, Mr. Brown, Ms. Wagner, and all the teachers that help work in the program. And I will look forward to another year here at 21st century. Thank you for acknowledging us and letting us tell you about the wonderful 21st century at CHMS, my GPS for success.
Thank you. Let's give them another round of applause. And uh, if, if, if you get remain, I think I think your, your parent wants to take a picture. If you want to stay up here, you come on. And I just I, while she's coming, I want to thank you all for coming and presenting to us tonight and, and doing it in such a, a well a, um, a well fashion and showing such great bravery by doing it. Thank you all. We'll now move to agenda item 5.2, electronic vote consideration to adopt social studies textbooks. <coughs> I'll now entertain a motion. Move for approval. Second. Motion's been made by Ms. Hines and second by Ms. Williams. You will now place electronic vote at this time. It's unanimous. Agenda item 5.3, electronic vote consideration of the annual special education plan and part B flow through for the 2019-20 school year. I entertain a motion at this time. Move for approval. Second. Been made by Mr. Lamb and second by Ms. Williams. We will now have vote electronically. It's unanimous. Thank you. Now move to agenda item 6.1, resolution, Dr. Kamani. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Dr. Bracey, member of the boards, I bring for your consideration this evening a resolution for National Teacher Appreciation Week. Whereas teaching is an honorable profession, one which all Americans know well because of their personal experiences, and whereas the National Education Association and the National Parent Teacher Association spearhead the annual observance of the National Teacher Appreciation Week, which commenced in 1984, and whereas National Teacher, National Teacher Appreciation Week, May 6th through 10th, 2019, recognizes educators' significance to our nation's future and our students' future well-being, now therefore be it resolved that the Portsmouth City School Board convey its profound appreciation and heartfelt gratitude for the Portsmouth citizenry for those to those individuals involved in teaching and learning processes, for their diligence, for their zeal, and for their care of our great historic Seaport City's young people. And be it further resolved that the school board salute the division's teacher corps as a manifestation of respect and support 
for the magnificent role they play in the educational process that, and that the school board designate May 7, 2019 as National Teacher Appreciation Day. And be it finally resolved that this resolution of commendation be made part of the school board's official minutes and that copies be sent to all administrative units and schools for public display. Thank you, sir. I'll now entertain a motion. Move for approval. Second. Motion made by Ms. Lamb, Ms. Hines, second by Mr. Lamb. We would now vote electronically. Wow. It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item 7.1, electronic vote consideration of the minutes for the meeting held March 7th, 2019 and March 21st, 2019. I'll now entertain a motion. Move for approval. Second. Motion made by Ms. Williams, second by Ms. Hines. You will now vote electronically. It's unanimous. Thank you so much. No public comment. All right, we're going to forego eight public comment. We have no speakers. No, sir. At this time. Thank you. Agenda item 9.1. Monthly report, human resources, Mr. Whitney. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Bracey. Pleased to present to you the human resources report for the month of April 2019. And this month, it gives me great pleasure to acknowledge our teachers of the year. In your written report, you will see the names of each uh, Portsmouth Public Schools teacher of the year and special recognition goes out to our citywide teacher of the year from Water, William E. Waters Middle School, Mrs. Rachel Lasky. So join me in congratulating them. And I would also like to thank uh, the HR committee that put together that event every year. They do a fantastic job. This year's committee was chaired by HR specialist Sonia Harrell, and she was supported in that effort by all of the HR associates. So they did a fantastic job, and thank you to board members for coming out and supporting that event. Uh, at this time, I would like to entertain a motion that the, or ask the board to entertain a motion that, uh, to accept the transaction report as printed in your board documents. We will now entertain a motion for 9.2. Move for approval. Second. Motion made by Ms. Williams and second by Ms. Atkinson. <clears throat> you will now vote electronically. It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. We're now for section, I'm um, agenda item 9.3, electronic vote consideration of recommendation to revoke a teaching license for case number HR 1819 1. I'll now entertain a motion. Move for approval. Second. Motion made by Ms. Hines and second by Ms. Allen. You now may vote electronically. The replication. Six yes votes, one no, one abstention. It passes. Abstention is due to potential conflict. Thank you so much. Agenda item 9.4, electronic vote, consideration of recommendation to revoke a teaching license. Case number HR 1819-2. I will entertain a motion at this time. Move for approval. Second. Motion made by Ms. Hines, second by Ms. Allen. You may now vote electronically. Seven yes votes, one no. It passes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Sigma. Thank you. Agenda item 10.1, consideration of the financial report. For March 2019, Mr. Falk. Um, the report is in your in your packet, and I move for approval of the financial report of March of 2019. Move for approval. Second. Motion made by Ms. Hines. Second. I'm by Ms. Williams. Second by Ms. Hines. You may now vote electronically. It's, un it's unanimous. 
Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Agenda item 10.2, discussion of revised budget for fiscal year 2019 grant fund. Dr. Bracey. Thank you, Vice Chair Patillo. And good evening. Tonight we'll be presenting a topic that is challenging to understand for those of us who aren't C CPAs. That topic is the difference between the 2017-18 end of year carryover balances shown on the annual school report submitted to the Virginia Department of Education in September of each year and the fund balance shown on the comprehensive annual financial report published each December. As you are aware, this topic was the focus of, of a city, city council work session held on Monday, April 8th. City staff and council's angst during this work session centered around the fact that our annual school report, or ASR, showed a carryover balance of $17.8 million, while our comprehensive annual financial report, or we're referred to as CAFR, showed fund balances of $6.2 million. Predictably, the city's inference was that the school system was hiding the 11.6 million difference. There was even talk of, em of employing a forensic auditor. Ultimately, council asked the city attorney for a recommendation on how to proceed. As of yet, we have not received any information regarding what Mr. Ashby's recommendation is at this time. Bluntly, my staff and I took that conversation at the council work session as an attack on our integrity. What do you do when that happens to you? Generally, first, you go to the source who's being quoted by a person or persons questioning your practices, and then you also talk to experts in the field to see if your practices match theirs. So that's exactly what we did. Our first stop was at the Virginia Department of Education's budget director, Ed Lanza. If you recall, Dr. Patton reported to city council that Mr. Lanza claimed that the ASR and the C and the CAFR carryover numbers should match. Our CFO, Theo Falk, called Mr. Lanza to confirm that was the, that's what he actually said. Mr. Lanza told Mr. Falk that his conversation with the city wasn't quite exactly how city officials portrayed it. Mr. Lanza told Mr. Falk he had advised the city that there definitely were instances where the numbers would be different and even gave them an example that dealt with the timing of each report's accounting for accelerated state sales tax this fall. I'm providing you a copy of an email from one of Mr. Lanza's staff members, Kara Potter. Ms. Potter is an education finance manager with VDOE. You will note her observations confirm our contentions that the reports can, can and often will be different. Second, we reached out to another Hampton Road school system to see if their ASR and CAFRs were perfectly aligned. Mr. Falk talked with Pharrell Hunziker. Mr. Hunziker told Mr. Hunziker told what was taking place there. He said he had this to say about the ill-fated comparison. That you just can't do it. He even noted that like Portsmouth, Virginia Beach year-end carryover numbers on their ASR and fund balances on their CAFR are considerably different. What I'm going to do now is ask Mr. Falk to walk the school board through the key differences in the reporting methodologies that explain the why behind the conflicting numbers. But first, let me share a little irony here with you. Our ASR included the 5.2 million the city took from us in risk management funds, while our CAFR didn't. The reason was as simple as timing. The deadline for the ASR submission is September of each year. The city took those funds in October. The CAFR was able to reflect that movement of funds because it's published in December. So with that one explanation, the city's assertion of the 11.6 difference is almost cut in half. Now, Mr. Falk, I'll let you take over from here. Right. Good evening, Vice Chair Patillo, members of the school board. I appreciate the opportunity tonight to address two subjects in this presentation. Number one, the prevailing differences between the comprehensive annual financial report and the annual school report submitted to the Virginia Department of Education and why they're rarely going to be in perfect alignment. And then number two, I'm going to discuss pending amendments to the grant fund. As Dr. Bracey just noted, the fact that our CAFR and ASR don't match perfectly has proved to be a sticking point for our city officials. However, the truth is that those documents are rarely, if ever, going to line up because they employ different preparation methodologies. 
Therefore, the objectives of this presentation will be to advance an understanding of the varying purposes of a CAFR and the annual school report and their differences. And then again, I'll be specific about some upcoming revisions to the grant fund budget. What is a CAFR? The comprehensive annual report is exactly what its name implies. It's a thorough, detailed depiction <laughs> and examination of the school board's financial condition for fiscal year. It is prepared in the framework of accounting requirements established by the Government Accounting Standards Board, or GASB. Those standards outline those necessary supporting financial statements that must be included in the document. A CAFR must account for fund balances, which we're talking about tonight. A fund balance comprises the funds remaining after liabilities, meaning what you owe is subtracted from your account, your assets, which is the amounts you have. It's important to note that these fund balances must be confirmed as accurate. As such, a CAFR must be audited by an independent auditor using generally accepted auditing standards. Our 2007-18 audit was accomplished by the audit firm of Cherry Becker. It was presented to you on December 13, 2018, if you recall. The result of that audit was an unmodified or clean opinion, which is the best opinion you can get, that all our financial statements were presented fairly in material respects in accordance with all generally accepted accounting principles. What's the annual school report? Well, let's turn our attention to that. It is submitted to the VDOE each year as required by state code. The ASR provides financial data on school division operations to the Virginia Department of Education. The submission form and the instructions are very prescriptive because the VDOE wants to examine financial operations through the same lens. Not all school divisions budget the same way, nor do they have the same financial systems in place to manage their financial uh, information. So that puts all 135 school systems in the state of Virginia on the same playing field, so to speak. The data is used by VDOE for multiple purposes, such as reporting data on public education programs, but also reporting financial data that's used as the basis for state and federal funding formulas. The annual school report preparation requirements are determined by the Virginia Department of Education. It is reviewed, the ASR, by auditors as required by the Virginia Auditor of Public Accounts. It includes end-of-year balances, which are accumulations of balances over multiple years. It's also important to note that it's, not, that it's not on the same basis as the CAFR is prepared on, so the data will be definitely different on the ASR than what's on the CAFR. To highlight that point, the Virginia, as Dr. Bracey noted, the city leadership is of, of the opinion that the two documents should match perfectly. The city manager implied that the, there was the position of Ed Lanza, the VDOE's budget director. Um, we needed some clarification on that contention, so we contacted him, and he assured us that he did not point to perfect alignment as an expectation. We asked him to put that response in writing, which you have in front of you, I believe, tonight. He also asked one of his staff, Carol Potter, to send us an email. And let me share one quote from that email. It states, we also recognize that there are, can be differences between the CAFR, Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, and the ASR data submitted due to state reporting requirements differing from the local preferences of school divisions and their auditors. And that is a direct quote from the email that we received. So what type of differences are between the CAFR and the ASR? Well, one type of difference is a timing difference, which Dr. Brace alluded to earlier. The ASR is due to the VDOE on September 15th of each year, while the CAFR is completed in December. Therefore, there may be transactions that are not captured in the ASR because of the timing in September versus the CAFR that is done at a later date. Dr. Bracey already shared one example, but I wanted to repeat it. Back in October of last year, the city required us to return $5.2 million of carryover funds in our risk management fund or fund balance while the, at the time that we did the annual school report, we did not know that because that was done in September. <coughs> the, this requirement came in October. So that was captured in the CAFR. So there's a $5.2 million difference there between the two. 
the annual school report instruction manual always also gives us some, some guidance on this area. And it states, since the ASR FIN is due to the Department of Education by September 15, 2018, it is understood that audit adjustments may not be recorded in time to reflect be reflected in the submitted report. The report should be submitted by the 18th, September 15th due date for the 2018 ASR FIN with as many adjustments as practicable. So you can see the timing difference there. They're acknowledging in their document that that can happen. Differences between the ASR and the CAFRA methodology. There are some reporting requirements that are, that are vastly different. I'll share two examples. One, last year in accelerated sales tax. Normally, sales tax is paid to divisions about two months after it's collected. So if, you, if sales taxes for the month of June are paid in August, on a CAFR, you're going to take care of, you're going to look at those sales tax dollars that were given in August and revert them back to June because that's when they were collected and you can record them on your CAFR that way. Well, in 2018, the state changed the rule and those sales tax monies that were supposed to be accelerated were paid to us in December. So therefore, normally we would have received them in September, we received them in December. So there is one difference that between the ASR and the CAFR with accelerated sales tax. Number two, the ASR preloads revenue on a cash basis. So that means when you receive it is when they load that revenue. So if you receive money from June to, from July through June in a fiscal year, that's the way the ASR reports revenue. On a CAFR, it is recorded on an accrual basis, which means that some revenue you may receive after the year end is, a, is accrued to the financial statement of that year for that purpose because it's not on a cash basis. Thirdly, here are some Portsmouth specific examples of why we have some differences in our, in our ASR and our CAFR. The school construction fund was closed in September of 2014 and all those monies were transferred to the city. Also, the print shop fund was closed in FY 2016. Now, in the CAFRs of those years, those funds were recorded in the CAFRs in those years. But in subsequent years, those funds aren't in the CAFR because there's no activity to report. In the ASR, on the other hand, in that end of year balance, all of the activity that might have been there for years are sitting in that end of year balance. So therefore, that's in the end of year balance still currently, even though those funds have been closed for several years. So that is another difference um, as to why the CAFR and the ASR may not uh, be uh, congruent. So in summary, and I want to make these points, make sure that everybody understands, let me repeat. Number one, the documents are prepared on a different basis. Number two, there will be differences in the fund balances on the CAFR and the end of year balances on the ASR. Number three, all this information has been audited by our auditors and they've opined that it was in all material respects accurate. And then number four, we received a clean audit because there were no funds unaccounted for uh, in this situation. Now that concludes my first part of the presentation on the ASR and CAFR. I'd entertain any questions that any of you might have. Ms. Shumate. Thank you so much for that detailed um, display of the difference between the CAFR and the report. Uh, you stated that we were audited by Cherry Baccarat, correct? Yes, ma'am. Do you know of any other entity that was audited by the same company? Uh, Cherry Beckett is a, a, um, a audit firm that audits in a number of states, mm -hmm. um, mainly in the southeast, but all across the country. And um, they actually audit city as auditors as well. They are a leader in government and local government auditing. Um, I couldn't tell you how many audits they do, but they do a whole lot over the course of the year. Correct, but they audited us. Do you know of any other local entity oh, that they audited? Um, uh, Chesapeake. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, who else is that? I believe still Newport News is one of their clients, I believe. Um, City of Portsmouth. City, City of Portsmouth, obviously. Um, they have a number Thank of... You. Yeah. That's what Thank you. That's what you wanted. They tried to get you. <laughs> You almost, you almost missed your alley-oop, Mr. Fox. <laughs> I know. I, I almost. Really? 
Ms. Williams. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I, I thank you, Vice Chair uh, Patillo. I just want to thank uh, Mr. Falk for that detailed explanation. I like the fact that you call the department, Virginia Department of Education, and they sent us a, an email confirming what Dr. Bracey had told us, but we're getting conflicting information from the city manager. And I, I'm getting pretty tired of the city manager and the city council constantly trying to disparage this board that's trying to do what we've been asked to do and try to do it with integrity. So I just want to thank you. And for those of you that do not know, Mr. Falk, I believe, is a graduate of I.C. Norcom? Churchland. Churchland High, well, Portsmouth Public Schools. He does have a CPA, and, and we are happy to have him come on board as our CFO starting in November. And he came from the great city of Chesapeake, well recommended by Dr. Roberts. So I thank you for giving us those details. I appreciate it. Mr. Lamb. Thank you, Acting Chair um, Patillo. Um, I just got a, a question, and I'm just going to be nice and say, you know, comments that was made. I, I watched the video, um, as, as many individuals did. What I don't understand is this. Why did, did the city manager or anyone else on that side take the time to just ask us on our side why there was discrepancies? Or did they just go straight, as the video mentioned, did they just go straight to the VDOE, ask the same person that we just asked, and now we got two different stories? I mean, to me, it would have seemed like, you know, we had a joint uh, meeting of the minds, if you will, on a Saturday. Most of us came there, and now all of this is occurring. Um, I, I just think that wouldn't it have just been simpler that if you had a question about the CAFR and an ASR, that you could have just turned around and asked the question to, to our side? I mean, uh, according to the video, I, I'm, just, I'm just curious. They're, they're saying one thing. I would like to know if anyone that can answer it, Dr. Bracey or or Vice Chair, or Acting Chair uh, Partillo, did we not get a phone call or an email asking uh, of the differences of the two? Because to me, that just would have seemed the most logical common sense to have done versus what, what had been put out there. I'll, I'll, I'll take the first part of that, Mr. Lamb. And we did have a meeting with the, the, Dr. Patton and her finance team, and we attended with our, with our finance team. And at that meeting, they had already contacted the um, Atlanta and gotten heard. I guess they heard what they wanted to hear from that from that dialogue, because clearly he gave them the same information. But I guess it's a matter of interpretation to the argument that you're trying to make. But they, when we met with them, it was the questions were already loaded. You know, they were saying, "Okay, where's the?" We see the 17 million, we see the 6.8, so where's the 11.5? So that's not the purpose of us attending that meeting. We were going up there to talk to them about, specifically about grants. So they delved into that. So at that point, we just listened to what they had to say. But we, we shared with them that let us take a look at this and then we will follow up with you. But that was a, that's a lot of, um, that was a lot of information for us to to pull together at that time. So we're, we were going to get back in contact with them, as I stated, Tuesday night. So that's what we're in the process of doing now. But we will follow up with them. I did receive a, a, a memo today from Dr. Patton wanting to know the, the differences between the CAFR and the ASR for the previous three years. As Mr. Falk stated, there are a number of reasons why they're not matching. And to go about trying to figure out what the differences are in all those accounts that have rolled over through the numerous of years, that's going to take time. And we will, we're going to have to get someone to, from the state to even explain to us, how do you go about doing that? So that's where we are with that. I will respond to the, 
the memo tomorrow before we leave for break because it was stated that I had a deadline of, of Wednesday to get it to her. Well, we're on spring break next week. And as far as deadlines go, my school board members will define dates and deadlines for me to follow. So when we get this information together, we will follow up and respond to their questions. Mr. Falk, is there anything else that you wanted to add to that, sir? That was accurate. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Ms. Atkinson. Thank you, um, Vice Chair Patillo. Um, and thank you, Dr. Bracey and, and Mr. Falk for your transparency. I just wanted to um, just follow up on uh, what board member Williams said. I mean, I, I guess at this point it's just, it's just I'm, I'm tired. It's, it's like we're, we're playing politics with our children, and that's unfair to them. And they only have so many voices who can be a voice for them. So I, I can't believe every time of the every year during this time we're in the same situation. So my reasoning for saying this is I'm a product of Portson Public Schools. I'm a president. And usually I don't like to bring up you know, I'm, I'm for all schools and I'm a president, but I would like to make a call of action to the Norcom Greyhounds and any alumni of Norcom Greyhounds. The city manager volunteers on the football field. When she's in Norcom, she's pro school and four kids and she spread that message all over Norcom. So until we can get to some type of agreement and resolution and show that she's really about our schools, I think you guys as Greyhounds should release her. I mean, there's no way as a president that we would allow that. Woodrow Wilson alumni, any current Woodrow Wilson would not allow that. We learn different being presidents. So that is my call to action to Norcom Greyhounds. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lamb. Thank you again, Acting uh, Chairman uh, Parent. Or, I knew I was going to do that, Patillo, and I apologize. It's, at least it's not Bridgeford, that's right. Um, you know, I'm no, I'm no CPA, I'm no accountant. I did well to get through pre-algebra. I um, loved history, that's why I went into being a history teacher. But, but you know, my, this is what I don't understand either, so maybe someone could help me out here with this. I mean, from the dates that was given in that presentation from 2013 to 2018, have we not been under quarterly funding from the city? So if there was $11 million out there somewhere under quarterly funding, wouldn't that? I mean, I would think that since they were quarterly funding us, there would have been something that would have came up with that. I mean, that's one. Two, I recall several years ago, did we not come up with an updated monthly budget report that was more line by line than before? And so my question to that is, if it wasn't clear enough, again, why didn't someone ask questions? And, and my third point to this is, by what I understand and what we've been being told on this side, our finance committee and Dr. Bracey and Dr. Patton and their liaisons that works with the Finance Committee has been having ongoing meetings with all of this. So again, not with the economics background and so forth, <laughs> if the $11 million is, is somewhere out there and so forth, I would just think that with all of those safeguards that have been put in place that we would have found, this should have been found well before than on, on Monday evening. So I, I'm a little, help me out, I could be wrong, but I, I'm just a little confused. Is that possible? Can you go quarterly funding and then somehow lose $11 million like that? I mean. I, I wouldn't <laughs> think so with audits and with as much review on our financials that have been happening over the years, I can't imagine that there would be $11 million somewhere that someone would not have found at this point. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lamb. Ms. Williams? 
Yeah, I guess mine is more of a statement than, you know, question, because um, I was saying the same thing. You know, Dr. Bracey and Dr. Patton meet uh, quarterly or monthly or whatever. The school board liaisons meet, but nothing ever comes up to this board until it's budget time. And then every year there's a different, there's a different issue. One year was 17 million that we were hiding, which was risk management, OPEB, all restricted funds, but they put that out there to the public because they don't know. And then they call around to certain people and ask them to put that out there, knowing it's a lie. And then when the person finds out they're lying, then they, they attack them for lying to them. So I'm just saying we had a retreat, as most of us were there, and which I thought it was an odd retreat that you could not mention money because we are the school board that asked for money, but they would ring the bell if you mentioned money. But because we were <laughs> supposed to be communicating with each other. And I don't, I don't see this as good communication because I, I, I find it very distasteful that Dr. Patton, our city manager, would accost one of our school board members in Target and ask to set up a meeting with her to talk about what we're not doing when Dr. Bracey's on the third floor. And if you really want to get along and collaborate and I'm going to tell you, we were at the, the, the school board forum Monday night, and I can tell you, Tam and I sat there, and we almost felt like crying. When we listened to the mayor of Suffolk talk about the relationship uh, that you have to collaborate with the schools, they built those two brand new schools, they were giving the teachers raises, and we were like, you know, just like your spirit drops. So I'm just saying that every year, and, and, and please, Dr. Patton can do no more than that the city council allows her to do. And so, but every year, and I will say this, since Mr. Rowe came back as mayor, we've had nothing but problems. He was the same way when he was the city manager. So I'm, I'm tired of trying to sugarcoat things with them it is what it is. I don't think anything will change with them until perhaps 2020, when we can make some changes. Because for them to do this every year, and this is a third straight year that we've had level funding, no money for the teachers' raises, none of that. Dr. Bracey has to find the cuts. We've closed schools. We've eliminated positions. Because our position is, We've got to get these teachers and the staff these raises or they're going to leave. And you all know it's a shortage all over. So we're going to do the very best that we can with what we have to make sure the school system functions. Dr. Brace has done a good job. He's done what was asked. When he came here with six schools accredited, and now there are 14 out of 19. So we're going to try to keep moving forward. And I'm not sure what, what it is, why they can't. I mean, they gave raises to the city employees, constitutional officers. Everybody gets a raise but the schools. So I, I'm just disgusted, and I guess you all have heard my disgust. But thank you, Mr. Fox. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for your transparency and correcting the trumped-up accusations. Thank you. <laughs> And I have a little more to go on grants. So if we continue, grant fund budget revisions. We, we have to do some grant fund budget revisions. But I wanted to give you some background. Portion Public Schools receives grants from several different agencies. You have federal grants, state grants, other uh, organizations as well. Many of those grants are multiple year <laughs> grants where the funds can be spent anywhere from 16 months to five years fr from the time of the initial award. So therefore, with the grants that are longer than one year, those funds can be carried over for expenditure in future years. 
uh, let me note that grant funds can only be used for those specific activities that were approved <coughs> in the grant award letter by the individual funding agency. So we couldn't take grant funds and use them for something else. It would have to be for that specific grant program. Types of grant budget revisions. One type is a budget revision that occurs when the actual amount of the grant award is higher or lower than the amount that we included on that year's adopted budget. So, for example, if I had a grant that was a million dollars and I budgeted a million dollars and I received an award increase of, let's say, $250,000 during the year, I would have to make a revision to increase that budget amount by $250,000. $250, excuse me. The second type of revision is where Portion Public Schools is asking for reappropriation of carryover funds from grants that have a duration of more than one year. So those grants that are anywhere from 13, 16 months on to five years. So the background on why we need a, a revision uh, and why we're requesting revisions. During our 2017-18 audit process, the auditors noted and disclosed in our audit report that grant carryovers were not included in our appropriation of the grant fund that we had asked for. So therefore, no, acknowledging that, we developed a resolution to ensure that those amounts, amounts would be accurately included in the grants fund budget uh, going forward. We brought that resolution to you on two seven, February 7th of 2019. You approved an increase of $4.2 million to the grants budget at that time. Once the city received that resolution, they had some questions and requested additional supporting documentation. Excuse me. We revisited our calculations and devised a revised and developed a revised amount of that increase to the grants fund. After those revisions, we came back and the grant budget revision now is approximately eight million dollars. We made we made some errors in our initial calculation. We will acknowledge that, but we went back and did a line by line, uh, grant by grant review. And so now that number is $8 million. Um, as requested by the city, we've gathered documentation to support, support those revisions, and we'll present those uh, to them once that review is done. And we want to make sure that, that, that the documentation is complete and accurate. And if you can imagine, for this number of grants that we have, it's a lot of documentation. And it has to tie, tick and tie, and be accurate as we present. Um, once that review is done, we'll present that to the city staff. And then after that, we'll bring back to you a revised resolution to match uh, the increases to the grant funds at a future meeting. Mr. Lamb. Thank you again, um, yeah, Chair. I, I have a question just, just about grants. Yes, okay. Well, first off, as you just pointed out, there was had to go back, review, and now mm -hmm. we're up to $8 million. Yes, And sir. you're saying that we have documentation to prove and to show that it is $8 million. Yes, sir. So there's no surprises two months from now or something that you're going to be standing up here and saying six and a half or... No, sir. Okay. That, that's my first thing. The second thing, how I understand grants, and correct me if I'm wrong, basically, you know, the city is the the legal entity and so forth where all the money flows into, including grants. Yes. So if we get a grant from XYZ, say for uh, textbooks, mm -hmm. it's going to go there into th that grant category. Yes, sir. And it cannot be used for anything else, meaning we or the city cannot move that into the general fund or we can't use it for transportation. It has to be specifically used for textbooks. Yes, sir. That's correct. And, and, and so when it is appropriated uh, to us and so forth, it's only used for textbooks, and it can only stay in that category as they hold on to it. Yes, sir. That so again, I'm back to a question. Where, why is this an issue? I mean, that to me is very clear. It, uh, you know, with grants. It's not money in a general fund where we can have a discussion or a debate. If it's, if it's money that is designated for a grant from the state or the federal government and there's no leeway on that, why is this even an issue? 
I think the issue in this case came from that the carryover balances were not dis were not included in the appropriation amount. That that's where the issue resided. However, you are correct. We can't use that money for anything other than the purpose that the grant was given for, and it's more of a record keeping uh, item than it is that money is being used for something that is not supposed to be used for. Thank you so much, Mr. Falk. All right. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Allen. Mr. Falk, would you say that there is a difference between um, municipality governing of finances and school governing of finances? What do you mean, in what way? It, it appears that from the city side, they have an opinion of how our funds are dispersed, what can come back, what can go forward. And then it seems as if on this side, the city isn't understanding the size, if I'm making myself, if I'm making any sense. The, so is there a difference in how finance is done from a city perspective and from a school perspective? No, ma'am. Not, not in my opinion. However, the difference between schools and cities are we're appropriated by the, by the city, right. by state code. Any monies that are left at the end of the year have to be reverted back to the city for them to decide whether they reappropriate those to us. That is the major difference. They don't have a, a agency that reappropriates to them. So that's where the major difference entails, and that's why there are some different. That's why this issue has come to light because all of these things have to be reappropriated by the city to us. And the reason why I guess I'm, we've spoken to Mr. Lanza. They've spoken to Mr. Lanza. And the interpretation, it seems it's red over here, it's black over here. So I'm not understanding how can we, how can we help the city understand how the division has to disperse this money and things of that nature because it's clearly a um, educational discrepancy in how it's supposed to be done. That one I can't answer, to be honest with you. It, that, it would have to be a general understanding of how these things work, and I'm not sure why they got a different uh, uh, interpretation than what we received in writing from Mr. Lanza in that case. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your work. Now, I believe the only way to help them understand would be to replace them at the end of the day. Miss mm -hmm. Williams. Yeah, uh, I guess my question is the grant fund um, the, their concern was that it was carryover funds, yes, ma'am, and that it was not sent to be reappropriated right. back. Okay, now I guess my question is the grants funding that's basically is federal funding. Well, it's federal, state, state other, other, other agencies, other, any that kind give of grant, money. yes, ma'am. Okay, so all, all funding, whether it's federal grant, whatever, the has to be asked to be reappropriated back. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, and and it has to be reappropriated just to make sure I'm correct. Yeah. They, 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 can't they, 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 the, they can't keep grant funds. Grant funds have to be right. returned. Exactly. Oh. So what is the issue with them? If I mean the grant fund they can't keep. It has to come back to us. So is their issue was that we didn't turn it over to come back? We didn't request a reappropriation at the end of the year for those carryover funds. That's the issue. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Well, well, it's different from from the. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. But because they have to send it back to you anyway, right? Right. So, okay. Right. So how is that uh, considered? Uh, okay. Miss uh, Hines and then Miss Atkinson. Thank you, um, Acting Chair Patillo. With the 4.2 that we sent in February, mm -hmm. um, and we have reviewed it, and now it is an $8 million comeback, mm -hmm. while we have waited since February for this to be approved, are we in any danger of running out of funds um, waiting for this approval? Because my other concern is the fact that we have money sitting out there that we have spent that we are now waiting on reimbursement. So my concern is, where are we going to be with spending, and are we at it? Are we at an issue yet with spending and reimbursements? No, ma'am. There's not an issue with spending and reimbursements. They're still going on 
as, as they normally do. This is more of making sure that those carryover balances are within our approved spending authority, meaning reappropriation for the future, because you're not going to spend all of an $8 million right. within one year because those grants are multiple year grants and you have time to spend them. So no, ma'am, we're okay. not in any danger. So the next question, just because I want to make sure that I understand 4.2 to 8 million, my math is about 3.8. Some I teach history, so excuse my math. Um, but is that three million and change part of that eleven million dollar delta between the six and the seventeen? No, ma'am. They okay. don't have anything to do with each other. Okay. I just I have to ask the question. Right. Thank you. Ms. Atkins. Thank you, um, Acting Chair Patillo. Um, so, is do we need to go to the media? Um, and I'm and I'm coming to you, Chair, to put this information out since there was false information put out regarding the grant and the other funds, do we need to go to the media with this? Well, I think well, what we've done is we've tried to, the, the question was, was put out to us, well, give it to us when they were having their work session. So it was publicly displayed at that time. So we wanted to make sure that we did the same thing in our response to make sure that the public knows that we haven't done anything um, wrong, we're not malfeasant, and that's why we wanted to make sure that we did this presentation in this room so that everyone could see and hear the discussion and the dialogue that we were having about the grants, about the ASR and the CAFR, to make sure that everyone understands. Uh, the, the reporter from the city council meeting Tuesday did approach me and she said that she would follow up if she needed to have any if she had any follow-up I think she and um, Sarah I think we're working on the story together so we have provided information that has been asked of us so they are getting gathering that information uh, as well so that's so it's, it's it's we are addressing it as far as the media and to the public as well Okay, because I just want our side of the story to be heard because the city side of the story is always published. Mm -hmm. But then when it comes to our side of the story where it's not published. So I just want our side to be heard, and that's the truth. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lamb. Thank you again, Acting Chair Patillo. Um, and just to... Um, piggyback off of um, board member Williams with regards to what she was saying about carryover um, and, and to be able to understand it. So there was money left over, which would have been a carryover, you know, over. We didn't count it. Shame on us. Mistake. Corrected. Now it's up to $8 million. So it goes back for reappropriation, but still it doesn't matter because it's $8 million of grant money, which grant money that was given to the school division for specific things. So again, I, I just don't see where there's, I, I don't see where there's a delay, there's a question, because by what I do understand with grants, it's very specific. So what's, what, what, what's the deal? I can't answer that particular question, but it, we're providing the information to ensure those amounts are appropriated. Thank you. Ms. Allen? There's several concerns that I have that, that I don't want them to be all balled up into one. The first one is when we are, the city looks bad when we're all fighting. That's case in point. Our job is to make sure that we take care of our students and our staff. The city's job is to appropriate the funds for us to do that. It sends a bad message to our teachers and to our students when our city feels it's okay to invest in everything but education, our teachers, and our students. There is no us without them. Without our teachers, there are no future for us here. We are already struggling. 
and this fighting is not helping anything. I think it's important to remember who voted which direction in 2020. And I find it disheartening that we haven't heard from all of our council members on where they stand on this. Each and every one of them, the majority, run on education. Whenever anyone wants to talk about the city of Portsmouth, we always hear about our great schools and the future of our schools. We have other divisions that are building new schools while we're still struggling to get ours done. We have a bunch of cities that are pouring into their divisions every year. And every year while I've been on this board, I have constantly had to deal with this strife. It shouldn't be this way. What are we telling our citizens that we really truly believe in? You can be pro-school and pro-police. Split the difference. But at what point do we stop ending up in the newspaper that we can't get along? And this, all, this is the only time where we're having an issue is when it's budget season. So I think everyone needs to call their city manager email her, your city council people. I want to hear from each council member where they stand on education and where they stand on funding our schools. For some reason, all of us have no problem speaking, but all of them are staying silent. The majority of them are staying silent. It's time to hear from our council members. Our city manager works at the pleasure of our city council. That means she does as they collectively ask her to do. It is time that we ask our city council people to collectively direct the city manager to fund Portsmouth Public School raises for our educators. Thank you, Mr. Barnes. So I have a couple of questions. So we asked city council for some money to help fund our teachers raises and, and what did they say? We, we, we just we got a level 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 budget. So that yeah. means no. Right. So with that being said, we we have to look at cuts, correct? Yes, sir. That means raising class sizes is possible, eliminating middle school sports, trimming the pr proposed salary increase, cutting transportation to programs, including sports and other after school programs. Now, somebody who runs an organization that deals with children, I do know that if we cut programs for our children, that's going to leave them out on the street. And when you leave children out on the street, that puts them in situations that will be negative. Take it for somebody who lost a 12-year-old cousin in the streets. He got shot and killed because a lot of people in those neighborhoods don't have anything to do. Now imagine if we cut these services for our children and what's going to happen to our children. So, so me personally, for somebody who has three children in the school system who will be affected by these cuts, I think we do need to contact our council people and our city manager and let them know that we need this funding for our kids. It's very important that we do that. And I appreciate all you guys have done to let them know what we've been doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lamb. Um, just a question, because this has gotten brought up now a couple times with regards to possibly having to either um, cut back or trim the, the, the raise. Um, we're, we're asking for a 3%, but someone help me out here. I don't think, because we only gave 2% last year, and the, the state or the Commonwealth Code says five, and you can split it over two years, we're obligated on this three. So that's 2.6. But if we don't do the three, and if we do try to uh, cut back, then ultimately um, there, there's really, we give a little, let's just say, for example, we give a little, but don't we have to return back to Richmond something like, close to a million dollars it's something like 949,000 or so it's if we don't make the three percent which I, I don't see any options with that I mean 
the cuts are going to have to be made. You know, the question comes down to what do we prioritize in cuts? But the, the thing is, if we don't make the 3%, we're actually having to turn money back over to, to Richmond to the tune of 949, 979? I think it's 9,772,000. I believe mm -hmm. it's the number. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, that's correct, oh, Mr. Barnes. I, also, I did miss one cut, and I think this is a very important program in the city of Portsmouth, which is reducing or limiting the star, vic star based victory program. Mm -hmm. I can't see how that could happen. So I, I really, listen, guys. You really need to contact your city council through email, phone calls, show up in their office, show up in their meetings. They're not going to talk to you when you get up here, but just keep coming. And they, they'll race the non-agenda speaker so you can't see it on TV, but somebody come in and, and, and have a Facebook Live video, take turns doing it so people can see what's going on in these meetings. And I just want to say that we, uh, we haven't made any decisions on cuts as a board as of yet, but there were a list of possibilities that were sent out that could possibly be affected by cuts by not receiving proper funding from the city. Ms. Hines. Thank you. Um, I was going to say Cardell. Thank you, Chair. Cardell, um, Cardell thank you. Um, but to go back to the point about the raises, if we do not give any, we're turning over 940000 and some change. Um, if we do not give a raise. The other piece that we are missing here is the $1.7 million that the state is willing to kick in for these raises that will be given to us in perpetuity. So by not giving any funding for a raise, we are turning back close to a million dollars and we are not receiving another 1.7 million. So in essence, it's a loss of 2.7 million 2.6, let me do the rounding math real quick, 2.6 million for not doing this, that we will lose out because we could not come up to the five. So we have to give back and then we leave laying on the table the 1.7. I just want to make sure that those numbers are out there. If we are able to give a 1% raise, which is 860 some odd thousand dollars from our budget if we still continue to get level funding, we still get 1.7. That's correct. If we give a 2% raise, which for us is about 1.7, we get another 1.7 from the state. However, we would still have to give back the 940 because we didn't make the 5%, correct? Say that one more time. Okay, so sure if I we give a, a two last year, two this year, mm -hmm. The two this year for us is 1.7. Right. The state kicks in 1.7. Right. But we're still turning in 940 because we didn't make the 5% that the governor's biennium budget proposed. Yes, ma'am. Those numbers are important because if anybody's going to tell me that I can go and buy something and I have to put in a dollar and they're going to put in two, that's a good deal for me. If I have somebody that's going to say, hey, I'll go 50-50 with you, that's a good deal for me. I'm going to do it every day. And so I just want people to understand what we're getting for what we're giving. If, if we give, we get double. If we give a little bit more, we get even Stevens. I, I just, I, I think that's a big part here when you, look at, when you look at the numbers. We all know on this board what is behind the numbers when we look at the numbers. I just need everybody else to look at the numbers for what they are and for what they do for our city. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hines. Ms. Yep. Atkinson. Thank you, uh, Acting Chair Patillo. Um, I just want to put it out there that I've actually been saying for the past two years to cancel the city manager, Dr. Pat. This, this, is, this is not new. Like, I'm smiling because I've been putting this out to the city of Portsmouth. <laughs> to cancel her a long time ago. You cannot call her because she does not return phone calls. She does not answer meeting requests. It's, it's, it's nothing that cannot be done. In other cities, they have accountability to where if you contact <coughs> the city manager or city council that they have 72 hours to get back to you. In Portsmouth, they're not required to get back to you. They only answer to certain people. So it would be pointless 
for us to call the city council or city manager because they don't have to talk to us. They don't have to call us back. It's a lot of citizens that call Dr. Patton. I have, I have records of me calling the office and getting the gatekeeper every day, recorded. When was she going to call me back? We don't know. Five days in a row. And this is from a year ago. So I know if she gets a call from Ms. Atkinson now, she's not going to answer. So it's nothing that can be done. And we keep saying it. It's, it's not going to happen until 2020. And I'm going to make another call to action. I see the media here. Sarah Gregory is here. You guys are not aggressive enough with the city. Dr. Patton runs out this door every day. She, her office hours are nine to five. I have not seen nobody go to the, go to her office and stand outside her office. If you guys really want to talk to her, you guys have the opportunity. No one approaches her. She runs all the time. So it's, it's, it's no communication. It's nothing that can be done. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to move to agenda item 11.1. Thank you. I'm going to hijack the microphone. I just want to say that since Monday, and thank you for the acknowledgement, Cardell. Uh, since Monday, when we are at regional VSBA at the brand new Fred Cherry in Suffolk and we're all drooling and we're all misty because everybody there is talking about collaboration and supporting each other. Um, we begin to get text messages from the work session about what's being said and what's being shared and probably like most everybody else, I went home and watched tape, you know, because I'm that old sports person. I'm going to go watch what I did wrong. I'm going to go watch my competition. The sad part about what I just said is that city council number one should not be our competition. It should be a collaboration. However, I know that everybody else on this dais has done the same thing. And I know that everybody else on this dais has blown your phone up, has blown your office up, has blown your email up, and probably has knocked on your door several times this week. A heartfelt thank you because I wanted to come and knock and I wanted to come and sit and I wanted somebody to come and explain it to me but at the same time I understood that progress was being made so I did not want to impede progress. But I just want to say thank you to, your two, to you two gentlemen specifically and, and, and Mr. Folk, your staff as well because I know you guys are burning the midnight out, the 3 a.m., the 6 a.m., the can't sleep, you know, you're, I get it. So from all of us up here to Dr. Bracey and to Mr. Falk, I want to say thank you to what you guys have done. And I'm going to say thank you for what you're going to continue to do because it's April the 11th and we still have a long time to go. So until next time, you'll get another thank you, I'm sure of it. But for this short week and for these 48, six, six, I'm not a math person, so whatever. These three days, I know what you guys have done. And with heartfelt thank you, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hines. Oh, you're <laughs> uh, we now have our monthly report by our superintendent, Dr. Brees. Thank you, Reverend Patillo. And Ms. Hines, I, I do sh share the same sentiments that you shared about Mr. Falk. I ask him at least once a week, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> are you doing fine? Because since he's come on board in November, I'm sure this has been like any, unlike any other experience he's ever had walking into a job in the line of fire. But he's handled it gracefully. And he, I'm telling you, when we start talking about numbers, he's the smartest guy in the room. And I want to make sure that everybody knows that. And, and, and I was told that when, when we hired him, that you, you've got the best CFO in the Hampton Roads. And from the, since November, I can attest to that. He is. He is, he's sharp, and, and thank you, Mr. Falk. So I want to make sure I tell you that because <laughs> you are, yeah, we're, we're taking a beating right now, but hang in there, hang in there. It's, it's going to get better. As uh, some of the board members said, you know, it, it's going to take a little time, but we're going we're gonna to be okay. So you hang in there. And I, I need you by my side. Right. Yeah, so don't, don't leave us. Right. <laughs> You're a valuable part of our senior staff. <laughs> 
ahead. Uh, <clears throat> just a couple of things I wanted to share is um, we, had, we had our last teacher advisory meeting uh, Monday at John Tyler, and that meeting, most of the teachers at that meeting just really wanted to talk about uh, where we were with the budget. So, you know, we, we talked about that and everything that was taking place, and some of them from that meeting came to the city council meeting on Tuesday, and some of them addressed the, the council as well. So great year of meeting with them. Um, also have the, as Tanaya mentioned, the students, the last meeting with them is the April 25th, and the last parent meeting is the 29th. So those are, the, those are three valuable groups that I meet with, as well as the PTA uh, advisory board. And they're having their end of year dinner um, May 3rd yeah, at um, 6 p.m. at the Renaissance. And not that I need to tell you, but next week is spring break. Is it? Yes, it is. So please, by all means, enjoy, relax, and relax. But uh, I think we all need a break. Unfortunately, or fortunately, it depends on how you look at it. We didn't have any, any inclement weather, so we've been going hard at it since our last break. Usually we get a th few days here in between with snow, but that didn't happen this year, so all of our teachers and staff, they definitely need a break. So just wanted to throw that out there. And April 23rd, we'll be back at the city council because that's the next public hearing. So I wanted to make sure that everyone knows that because we will be back to make sure that council knows the importance of them funding our request for the increase so that we can give our teachers and staff what they generally thoroughly deserve. So that concludes my comments. Thank you so much, sir. We have board member reports. First up, Ms. Atkinson. Thank you, Acting Chair Patillo. Um, I just want to say I didn't get a chance to attend the meeting, but I did watch a live video. And just watching that live video and the teacher speaking was very emotional. I mean, and to, to sit and hear those stories of what teachers go through day in and day out and not even make a comment shows a lack of compassion. I mean, just watching live, I was tearing up. And I said to someone after hearing those stories, how can you not fund education from listening to those teachers? But we will see. We will see if all of those who came forward, and it was several people, if what they said mattered. It's only a matter of time. And like I said, we will see. Um, I just want to, again, thank you, Dr. Bracey, for your work. I was, I was privy to information and the reason, the reasoning behind and what's being spread in the community is they don't want Dr. Bracey to succeed because of who he are. And I don't have to throw the cards out there or say, say it for what it is, but that's what it is. And that's what's being spread in the community. So whatever it is that they got to do, to make him struggle or make it hard for him, they're gonna do that. So that's what was told to me. But Dr. Bracey, keep fighting. You already have made our schools look good, 50% increase in accreditation without assistance. So you can only imagine when we change our city council what he's gonna do being here. So once we do that, we're, we're gonna be great. We are already great. We have amazing students. Um, we have students that has drive and ambition. And we have students that need that extra push. So that's why we need that funding so we can provide those opportunities. Because like <laughs> board member DeAndre said, we have students, and I'm wearing it on my shirt, rest in peace, Nipsey Hussle, um, that come from those same backgrounds who have passed. It's not many boards that can sit here as a school board member. We lost five students so far, five students under the age of 18 to gun violence. So if we cut programs, you can only imagine how many more students are going to play tug of war with the streets. And it's our, it's our job to retain teachers, higher quality teachers, 
and provide those opportunities to keep those kids busy, to help those ones that need that extra push that don't have that support at home. So I stand here as a school board member. I support teachers. I support everything y'all do. Thank you for all you do. Because I couldn't do it. I go in a classroom for one day and I go home with a migraine. So I can only imagine, <laughs> I can only imagine what you guys deal with on a yearly basis. And when you have a classroom of 30 students, 25 to 30 students, and probably 50% of them constantly needs your attention. I mean, I know you guys are popping Advils and, and whoever else knows, but you are appreciated. And we're going to work hard for you, and we're going to work hard for our students. You guys are who matter, so thank you. Thank you, Ms. Axon. Ms. Shoemate. Thank you, Acting Chair. <laughs> I forgot to say that last time. I apologize. Um, really quickly, I know we we thanked um, Mr. Falk, and we also thank our superintendent. But and we begged Mr. Falk not to go. Well, I'm begging you not to go as well, Dr. Bracy. Um, unfortunately, I've been where you are to be ridiculed in public and not really understand what's going on until the last minute. I've been there. It's not an easy place, um, and it's not a good place to be in. So I personally want to say thank you for all that you do. Stay with us. We appreciate you. Don't go anywhere. And I don't care who feels like you shouldn't be, be here. I feel that you deserve to be here. And that's enough for that one. I want to go on to um, a quick report. Uh, March 28, 2019, um, I attended the Boss Authors and Book Club with uh, Dr. Jacqueline Walker and Ms. Velvet Smith, and I read something beautiful. Let me tell you something. That was one of the most emotional times that I've had, and I've read to plenty of classes, and what she had the students to do afterwards were to give me a hug. Sometimes you just really don't know when you need that hug, and I really needed that hug. And so I just wanted to say thank you to Dr. Walker and Ms. Smith for everything that they're doing. Um, also, March 30th, 2019, I attended the Family Engagement Summit uh, that was located at the Renaissance, and we had some wonderful speakers. Um, Dion Chavis, which I would love for him to come here to talk about different ways to interact with our students. He had some wonderful ideas. Um, Dr. Gerald Ruff, um, Mackenzie Booth, and our very own Dr. Marie Shepard. Uh, this was a wonderful uh, summit, a wonderful program, and I learned a lot personally uh, from that summit. Also, if you can tell, I'm wearing Cavalier Manor. It's a shirt. I'm not only from Cavalier Manor, but I also wanted to acknowledge last Thursday this time, where earlier within that day, we laid uh, Mr. Joseph Wright, who we also call the mayor of Cavalier Manor, to rest. Um, and I want to give my condolences to his wife, Betty Wright, as well as their family and friends. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shoemake. Mr. Lamb. Yes. Thank you, Acting Chair. Um, just uh, two quick things here. Um, the Operations and Technology Committee um, had their uh, meeting this past week, and what was brought up, it was a short agenda, but uh, one thing that we're looking at, it's that time to start looking at um, energy efficiency, energy management um, throughout the, the division, and it was proposed of possibly um, to, to look at if we want to put an RFP out um, to see what's out there with regards to this. And it was discussed that we would probably just need more of a consensus of the board that we could take back to the committee for, for um, permission to do that. Of course, we've got one more meeting before we meet again in May. Uh, so that's something to consider. Maybe we can discuss at the next meeting. The other thing, which is, again, real quick, and I know we've talked extensively about this, about the budget, but um, 
I've, I'm still having a lot of heartburn off of the fact that on the video that was uh, shown uh, off the work session, um, it caught my attention that th as they were talking about what they fund, direct impact, and so forth, they brought up the vehicle maintenance service, which is what we've discussed here. And their number was that it cost $276,778. That's with positions. Does not include salaries. But yet, we discussed three board meetings ago that we're now having to pay almost close to a million dollars for for maintenance service. So again, I know we've discussed this, but I really think that we need to get the the paperwork with regards to what's being charged as far as, as servicing vehicles and so forth because again, outside of salaries, two hundred and seventy six thousand and some change versus close to a million dollars that's a, a huge difference. And I really do think that we need to find out what is being worked on, what is being serviced, what exactly are we paying for. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lamb. Uh, Ms. Hines. Thank you. Um, I, I don't want to. I don't want to beat around the bush um, when I say that we are not trimming fat out of our budget anymore to make this raise. For the past three years, we have been given level funding. The first year we cut some proverbial fat. Last year we were down to the tendon and to the bone, and this year we would be down to bone marrow um, to get to the 2.6 that we have to give. Over the past three years we've shut a school. We floated the planetarium over to the city for them to maintain so that it was off of ours. We've lost through attrition or through loss of staff that we just did not um, offer the position anymore about 30 positions over these past three years. So when we talk about, because what I hear from the community is, oh, the school board's crying wolf, you'll find a way to make it happen. In years past, we have found a way to make it happen, but at what cost? We've, we have lost professional development for our teachers. We have lost teachers that we will probably never regain again. People talk about decreasing um, ADMs, well, it's two or three kids per school. We still have to run operations for that school. And so I don't want people thinking, oh, well, we have this. Y'all are just crying wolf. I'm going to tell you we're down to bone marrow and we're down to plasma. So when we have to start talking about finding this in our budget, we are finding it through staff. And for those of you, as Ms. Ms. Adkinson, uh, Board Member Adkinson said earlier, for those of you that have been in a class of 27, let me introduce you to a class of 35 because that's what we've had before. I remember going as an instructional specialist and I would spend my Wednesdays with a teacher who had 36 fourth graders in her classroom. It took up the entire building from the cafeteria to her classroom just to get her class back into the classroom from the cafeteria. It took two of us on the recess grounds just to manage them. It took 35 minutes to get 35 kids to the restroom and back as fourth graders. That is lost instructional time. That is overwhelming for a teacher. That is overwhelming for the students that need that extra hand in their lives to make sure that they get that positive reinforcement that they need. So what I hear is, well, you guys do this every year and you find a way to make it happen. But I'm going to tell you, finding the way to make it happen this year is not going to be as easy as, oh, somebody's retiring and we're just not going to replace that person. So when we talk about it this year, I just want you to know we're down to the bone marrow. And so that's where we are and I just wanted to make it known that a planetarium a school at least 30 positions and God only knows what I'm missing but those are the big ones that everybody can see so that's what we've done over the past three years with level funding and so decisions this year if it's not are are not easy they're not walks in the park so I just wanted to say that and again thank you gentlemen thank you Ms. Hines Mr. Barnes So 
those of you know that I like to go on Facebook and, and stay live so I can keep the community informed. And I always tell the community that this is their seat. I'm just sitting in it. So with that being said, I have a couple of um, responses that they would like for me to ask the superintendent. Um, Nidra Hines wants to wants you to know that she, we she believes that we should add more special education programs um i'm i know we have some is it possible you can speak to them for her just have her um send a send me an email in re, in regards to that okay and then my last one came from Janara davis and he he wanted the school board to look into zoning. Rezoning? Rezoning, I'm oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> and my last remark, um, I went to a training yesterday, and, and this to go back to the, the budget. I went to a training yesterday, and I always like to talk with other people and see what's going on in their cities. And the conclusion that I got from all school board members in other cities all over Virginia, even at, on a national level, is that they don't seem to have the same problem with their city council that we have with ours. They, um, all of them told me, and I posted it on Facebook for the ones that I spoke with, some of them that I took pictures with, that they fully funded their schools. So that's just something for our city council to think about. They don't have to be different. They can be just like everybody else on that issue. Thank you. I'd like to close by thanking everyone for attending the regional forum uh, this past Monday. And again, it was, uh, it was refreshing and disheartening to see how many school divisions across the area that are working together with their city manager and city council. Uh, I will say I was talking with a fellow board member in Hampton, Newport News, and he said, man, he said, I, I feel spoiled over here looking at y'all. And I said, well, you know, we're fighters in Portsmouth, and we're, we're the Tupac of Hampton Roads. We always make a dollar out of 15 cents. <laughs> so I just want to tell Dr. Bracey, continue to keep working hard for our teachers and for our students and for our community, and we're going to continue to fight for you. And as always, we'll do what we have to do, but no school division should be put in this type of situation where you can risk having to pull from students in order to support staff. No school division should be put in that situation, ever. And we need to hold all of our leadership accountable, no matter the race, the relationship, or the status. They all should be supporting public education because public education will also support the economy and public safety. And Ms. Axon wants to have the last comment. So we just, Ms. Axon. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. We are the Tupac. And I just want to say, I just want to add some laughter to this. I heard Pharrell is need school buses for the something in the water festival. We are short of funding. So Pharrell, if you want to pay the city of Portsmouth to use our school buses so we can get some funding to help with these teacher wages, please contact our superintendent and their staff. Thank you. <laughs> I will now entertain a motion for adjournment. Thank you. God bless and have a good night. <laughs>